welcome to the podcast. I am so excited to introduce you to a new friend of mine, Miranda Greenwald. She actually works with schools on some marketing efforts. She's a consultant. Um, and uh, you're going to learn all about her background. Um, really got started a lot in the fundraising world, um, which comes in handy when we're working with schools. Um, she's going to talk really about her definition of marketing. Um, she's also a uh, college instructor for marketing. And uh, she really talks about, you know, marketing isn't just selling. Marketing is influencing and inspiring behavior. Think about that. Influencing and inspiring behavior. Um, sometimes we can get caught up in what a marketing plan is, and she's going to break it down into the steps of what that is and what that entails. Um, and we're going to dive deep kind of into the target audience and how your community gets information and gets communication. Um, you're going to learn a lot in this episode. You're going to love um, listening to Miranda and learning from her. Um, and if you love this podcast and you have not purchased your copy of Social Media for Schools, what are you waiting for? We've got this book out and available. Um, Buena Farrell says, I highly recommend this book to anyone working in school PR. Andrea is a wealth of knowledge, and this book has been so helpful and a great resource. We have 30 reviews out there on Amazon. We are at a 4.9. I've got one, four, and I've got 29 five ratings. You guys, this is a helpful guide to have on your uh, desk to help you through. You can uh, get it on Amazon. You can also head over to my website, socialschoolforedu.com to grab your copy. Now let's get to today's K-12 PR tip. All right. Today's K-12 PR tip is about Instagram and just a special shout out for all of my members that are currently going through our annual Instagram challenge. Woo! You guys are kicking butt. We are taking massive action. You guys are winning prizes. You're getting better on Instagram. Your community, your staff, your students love it. I'm so, so proud of you. So keep it up. But with Instagram, there are a lot of nuances that you may not realize, and I wanted to bring one to your attention. And this tip has to do with carousel posts. Posts on Instagram that you make to your feed or to your grid can have anywhere from one to 10 pictures, okay? But did you know that you can actually combine and post videos and photos in that 10 I guess, content, uh, you know, uh, type post, you can. I saw this and I was like, how did they do that? Well, it's Instagram just lets you. Um, whereas when you're on Facebook, it's often, well, it's pretty much impossible to post on a business page, both photos and images, uh, photos and video in the same post. Instagram allows you to do that up to 10. Uh, you could have three videos, you could have five pictures and, you know, and two more videos. You can do whatever you want as far as the combination of 10, but it can be a combination of video and photos. So I hope that helps if you ever get content or have content that you know you have both photos and videos. And, you know, on Facebook, that's really hard to do. You could post those on Instagram. You also may, may be able to post that onto your Facebook page from your Instagram account to be able to post both. I will warn you, I tried this this morning and it didn't give me that option. So um, just, you know, Instagram can be tricky. Um, I know for another one of our team members here at Social School for EDU, it did work. So Instagram, you can post up to 10 photos or videos in that carousel post. Now let's get to this week's interview with Miranda. Hello, Miranda, and welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> another, another Wisconsinite is joining me and Miranda is helping out schools with some marketing efforts. You've kind of got a unique background I and do. then your role um, with Marketing Matters by Miranda now. Um, why don't you tell me a little bit about your, your journey and then your current uh, role in helping schools? Sure. 
So when I was in business school, I was a marketing major and I knew pretty early on that my perspective and what I wanted to do was a little bit different from my classmates. Um, but I kept going with it because um, if I was honest with myself, I loved marketing and I loved everything about business, but I just didn't see myself in the you know high strong corporate world and in the for profit world. It just really wasn't wasn't for me. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but just wasn't didn't feel like it was for me. Um, so I stuck with it, and I'm so glad that I did because um, my very first job out of college was as a major gift officer for actually the university that I graduated from, and in that role, I was responsible for security hearing gifts of $25,000 and above. And I learned very early in that position that it wasn't ever about the money. Um, it was about connecting with people, learning about what their philanthropic goals were, how they wanted to make a difference in the world. And if we could find a way to connect needs at the university to things that they wanted to accomplish in their legacy, then we were able to make some pretty cool magic happen. Um, so I learned a lot just about connecting with people and moving communities forward. And even even though it's not really seen as a traditional marketing role, it really was word of mouth marketing. Um, well, looking back, it was pretty, pretty obvious, but it's not normally thought of as a marketing role. Um, so then I went on to become a major gift officer at UW La Crosse. And so I did that for a little while, um, found a really big passion for higher education. Um, it really reinforced it when I was there, but I still had an interest in kind of the traditional comprehensive marketing world, um, but still love the public sector. So I became the marketing and communications manager at the La Crosse airport. Um, and the airport was a department of the city of La Crosse. And so we were a government organization and I was the first of my kind hired at the airport to do marketing. And so it was a really new and exciting role. Um, we were really starting to realize how important marketing was for the public sector, um, even though it wasn't a traditional role that municipals hired for, but learned a lot in that job. I loved being around planes. I love travel. So it was a really great um, program to build. But it was really far away from home, and um, my husband and I wanted to start a family, so I had the opportunity to grow in my career again, and I became the marketing director at a hospital um, closer to where I live, um, moved into an executive role there, managed a team. Uh, we were a nonprofit, so kind of learned a lot about the nonprofit side of marketing, and okay. then... You know, I was there for about three and a half years and it kind of got to the point where this this pulling dream to be in higher ed and to start my own business just kept waking me up at night. And um, so I, I had the opportunity to join the faculty at UW Stout teaching marketing classes and it just felt like, okay, this is this is my sign. I'm going to do it. So I made the leap and um, was able to start my business alongside starting to teach. So that's that's where I'm at now. That's awesome. Um, I love the fact that, you know, traditional marketing is all about selling and mm -hmm. your first role, you stepped into that major gift officer. So mm -hmm. you're trying to get money, but essentially it's almost selling like the opportunity yeah. to give, exactly. but, but you kind of saw how that the connections were what mattered most. Right. Right. And, and I'm sure that now that you are, um, so you're, you're serving in a teaching capacity for UW Stout, but you're also starting to serve nonprofit and schools uh, with marketing efforts. And I'm sure those connections really matter in that yeah. realm, right? <laughs> They do for sure. Yes. And something you said um, really hit on. I always tell my students on the very first day of class that if there's one thing I want you to learn about marketing is that it's more than just selling products and services. You know, at its core, when we think about marketing and fundamentally what organizations are trying to do, it's influencing and inspiring behavior, you know, and if that's behavior and um, towards helping out a cause or advancing a mission or buying a product or service, whatever that may be, marketing is trying to inspire and influence behavior. And so when you can take that and apply it outside of the corporate world, and we can apply that to the nonprofit and the public sector, specifically in the public sector, that's really not been cultured to know how to do marketing. Um, it really starts to open up and, you know, you can see pretty evidently why it's important for organizations to think about that. Yes, definitely. Okay. So influence and inspire behavior. That's really what marketing is about. And when we think about schools, I guess, um, what would you say is the, the goal of, you know, cause I've got a lot of school communicators listening to that, this, and they're obviously trying to get students and get 
you know, keep students in their schools. So what would you say is that influ influence and inspiration that we're really trying to instill in that, in that audience, I guess? Yeah. Well, I think the most immediate thing is really just working to build stronger affinities between the school and the community. Um, you know, yes, the hope is that then that leads into growing enrollment and attracting students into the district. But before you do that, you have to build a strong affinity with your community through strong marketing. So how can we put out information and connect with our community that then creates brand ambassadors across our community so that, you know, we're not the only ones responsible for driving that enrollment, but how can we build a positive image and grow that connection so that when Grandma Sue is at Christmas and she's just been so thrilled about what the school's been doing, you know, conversation gets brought up about, you know, not being super happy with the district that they're in or whatnot. Well, can you believe what our school is doing? They, you know, you start to build those conversations and then all of a sudden you've got brand ambassadors that are going up to bat for you just because you've gotten good at telling your story and building those strong connections with your community. So um, that's kind of the first step. And then again, the once you can build that, then you can then use that momentum to, you know, and then it'll just work for itself. You know, then right. you bring students, you retain them, you attract teachers. And so um, it kind of creates this great momentum forward to be able to achieve all those things. Okay. And I'm sure everybody listening is like, oh, now I know why Andrea and Miranda get along because we're <laughs> talking about those, those strong connections in the community. And, you know, obviously social media plays a role in that, but it, it goes beyond that. And that's where I think you're really coming in to work with schools because a lot of schools are at kind of a, a different place than we've been in, in the past. You know, we got declining enrollment. We've got, you know, kind of poor community perception as a whole, uh, especially for our public schools. And we're really struggling to recruit those high quality teachers and, and even support roles are really, really tough. So I think schools are really being forced into thinking about marketing. So what are some of the first steps you take when trying to help a school create kind of that comprehensive marketing plan? Sure. No, that makes sense. I think the biggest thing that also kind of gets lost in the, the marketing shuffle is that I also try to tell my students and my clients that your brand, your, your logo is more than just colors and words on a paper. You know, your brand and the logo that you use to put your organization forward, that should serve as a representation of your mission, vision, and values, why you're there, what makes you unique. And if you can build a culture around understanding what it means to be a part of that school brand. Um, it provides a lot of great direction for then how we make decisions on social media and how we make decisions and how we write our press releases and where we, you know, when we talk on the radio and things like that. So really just starting fundamentally with their brand um, and thinking about, you know, how we're building those associations. So um, I'm also getting my doctorate right now. And so I, I read a lot of studies about consumer behavior and I, I love this kind of stuff. But when you think about how marketing works from a scientific perspective, you know, the brain really works as a filing system. And so when you see a brand like Target, when you're shown that brand, you know, you immediately have associations that your brain is making based on experiences that you've had with them, positive or negative, right? And so a school's brand, you know, if, if, if someone sees that brand, they're immediately going to have associations, positive or negative, based on things that they've experienced. And so if you can set a direction for a brand and you can then build your culture that then is reinforcing that, then you're building those positive associations every time someone sees that brand. And when you can build that momentum around it, then it makes those decisions a lot um, a lot easier and you can build a lot of cohesion that then helps with retention and things like that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, you hear the word brand and then you automatically think of a logo or you think mm -hmm. of the colors. Um, it's You certainly need some of that with it, but that's mm -hmm. not the only thing. Um, and, and really trying to establish, like you said, the culture, um, I'm thinking about, you know, the, just the word marketing plan is a little overwhelming, mm -hmm. but can you break down any steps of what is, what is a marketing plan? 
Sure. So um, the way that I can, the way that I try to approach it is, you know, first you should have what, what I like to call a brand promise. So just a paragraph that just articulates, you know, who you are, what you're trying to accomplish, what your goals are. Um, then you should have an articulated mission, vision, and values, which a lot of schools probably already have. Um, so sometimes it's a matter of just taking what's already there or is, you know, do we need to revisit it? Are there tweaks that we need to make? Um, but then from there, really starting to look at, okay, who are who are we communicating to? Who, who is our target audience? And that's kind of another big buzzword that I think gets thrown around a lot, but there's a lot more to it than people think. Um, you know, the more um, specific and intentional you can be about your target audience, the, the easier it is to then build out your marketing plan. So a big chunk of it is really trying to determine who are we talking to? And if someone tries to say we're talking to everybody in our community, you're not going to talk to anybody in your community. Um, and a lot of people have a hard time getting past the reality that just because you articulate that this is your target audience that you're trying to communicate to doesn't mean that nobody else matters, doesn't mean that there aren't other people that you're going to serve but you should have in your head, you know, who is it specifically that we're trying to talk to? Because then that then helps to drive the decisions. You know, what I always like to say is if you don't know what keeps your target audience up at night and what, what um, you know, encourages them or drives them toward being happy, then you're, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to communicate well to them. And so, you know, and it's not even just a matter of, oh, we're talking to parents, okay, well, who's the main driver in the parent situation making the decision about, you know, school activities, school enrollment, whatever. Okay, mom. Okay, is it every mom? Probably not, you know, because the mom that has a graduating senior, we're probably not talking to her. You know, is it the mom that's got multiple kids that, you know, they've got kids across multiple schools? Is it the mom that is really community forward? Or is it the mom that, you know what I mean? Like really breaking down that, you know, who is it that's going to be most likely to take action? And then let's talk to them. Because if we can encourage them to take action, then the rest of it's going to take care of itself. You know what I mean? Yeah. I like to, this is an analogy I just came up with, Miranda. I have six kids. If I yelled out to all six kids, hey, you've got to clean up, you know, the kitchen, nobody would respond. <laughs> but if I say, Kyra, it is your turn to clean up the kitchen. It's like you're directing that message. It's probably going to get taken action on. The other kids maybe hear it and they are really happy that it's not their turn, but they know <laughs> their turn's probably coming up. Yep. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just thinking like, it's okay to be direct and make sure, because sometimes, like you said, when you talk to everybody, you talk to no one. Right. Um, it's just like that email you send out where you're like, Hey, I need something. I, I need a story, uh, from your classroom. But if you specifically ask somebody, so I think that's really important. Um, and then you said something important as well as what keeps them up at night. So thinking like what they really are caring about is going to help your messaging and your communication and, and, and your branding and your marketing plan, right? Because similar to that, you know, um, and this sounds very cliche, but in the in the school district that I'm working with now, you know, I hear a lot, well, we're a, a small school with big opportunity. Okay, awesome. I'm glad to hear that. But every other small school is saying that. So what is it that we can say that's going to make you feel different? And it can't be something that applies to the broad community. Um, you know, because once you say things that are very general like that, you're not going to cut through the clutter. You know, it's kind of like in higher education. Oh, we have great hands on learning good for you. So does everyone else, you know? Yeah. Um, so really thinking about in your messaging that this is a chance to just move the needle on one segment of your target audience. And if we can move that needle effectively and then do that over and over again, then we're going to build momentum. But when you try to move everything all at once, you know, the world is too saturated, you know, right now that it's not going to be effective. Yeah, I think of those those individual stories are what's powerful. I mean, my, you talk about high, higher ed. My daughter is at UW Madison this year, and she's going to take a class right after the spring semester, um, and she gets to go to Iceland for two weeks. That's awesome. And, and they get to do hands on learning in Iceland. <laughs> so you talk about hey, we've got hands on learning experiences to hey, here's a story about a student who got to yeah. go to Iceland. You can see how that draws in their attention mm -hmm. and they're going to be like, wow, that is really cool versus the general <laughs> statement. Right. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're all, we're all about telling stories, um, obviously with social media, but within a marketing plan, there's going to be different ways that we're communicating, um, you know, our vision, our mission, our values, and we're communicating to that target audience. Um, can you list some of the various ways that schools should be thinking about like the tools they're using for the marketing efforts? Cause mm -hmm. there's a lot out there. And some of them we might, might not even think as marketing, but yeah. um, let, yeah, explain yeah, that, that. That's a great question. And I should, I didn't do a very good job of simplifying the marketing plan in the last question. So, so before okay. I answer that, let me just help. Cause you know, I think when you articulate your brand promise, then you have your mission, vision, and values, then you're articulating who your primary and secondary target audience is, but then it's then actually determining how that target audience likes to consume information and yep. what what kind of information motivates them. And articulating that is a really important step because then that then helps you make decisions as to what kinds of communications that you should be focusing on. You know, because okay. again, a lot of people like to, you know, organizations say, well, we're just gonna, we're gonna do everything. And again, well, if, if doing a newsletter, if newsletters aren't what's impacting or reaching your target audience, then why are you doing it? You know, I'd much rather you take that time and energy and put it towards social media. If that's what we've determined is the best tool for your target audience so that you're not, you're not wasting resources on things that's not actually moving the needle for your target audience. So determining that and then um, putting together then um, content strategies for how we're then going to reach them through those tools. So okay. like an example, and I'm sure you speak to this too, but, um, you know, if your target audience is this, then maybe we want to do 20% um, of our content on student stories, 30% of our content on new programming. So you can start to do a percentage of allocation based on what kinds of things your target audience cares about, which then helps you then to set content directions. So kind of going back to the tools, you know, obviously social media is the, the number one most powerful tool that schools can use. Um, but there's also press releases is a really big thing. Um, learning how to write a good press release and when to use them and when to not use them. Like, for example, you know, a lot of schools have, have gotten to be good at using social media on a regular basis, but then how do we change our strategy when we have a referendum or when there's a um, conversation in the community that's controversial? How are we, you know, how are we combating that? So press releases are a big thing, you know, if it's appropriate, newsletters and emails, um, direct mail can be a good tool, again, depending on the message and what you're trying, who you're trying to reach. Um, you know, there, there's lots of, I mean, you could do digital ads and things like that, but that kind of gets to be if you only have something specific that you're trying to really communicate. But the biggest thing are is social media, press releases, newsletters, emails, and sometimes direct mail, I would say. Okay. And then how does your website turn in or fit into that? Because I mean, obviously everybody has a website, they need a website, but is that something that is kind of just a uh, given that some of that yeah. information, those those tools and those um, methods are also going to be included on a website. So if somebody yes. wants to look for that information. Yep. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. I kind of think of it as a given. Um, yeah. It's not, it is a tool, but it's, you know, the way we the way we know it in digital marketing that I always teach my students too is that your website should be where you plant your roots in the digital world, right? And everything that you do should be trying to direct people back to your website. And so if you're if you're sharing a story on social media, you know, an opportunity could be that you share a snippet of it and then you know read the full story here on our website or read the full calendar of events on you know here on our website. You know, if you have a press release and you're talking about a referendum coming up, you know, visit this page on our website to learn more because you really want to try to direct that engagement in one place so that you can better gauge where people are spending their time, the content that they care about, where we're converting people. And so, yeah, your website should host any information that you're talking about through these tools. Yeah. My friend, Joe Sanfilippo is like, you know, no, no parent really wakes up in the morning. and's like, oh my gosh, I wonder what's on the school website today, <laughs> but they are looking at social media. They're looking at their emails. So, you know, all the things that you talked about are really ways that you are getting in, getting their attention. Mm -hmm. And then you can end up directing them back to that website, but it's not necessarily that they're going there first. Right. Yep. Yep. And this is kind of a, um, a weird formula, but I always like to try to coach organizations to think of it as like someone should be able to look at your social media, 
know, you know, get the story, know what's going on, leave with a good sense of I got what I needed out of that content. But for those that want to engage further should have the opportunity to do so. So you want to do it, get enough on your social media to where someone could look at that and feel satisfied with the information that they're being given, but also have the opportunity to further engage versus some people will go where they just put teasers out on social media and just, you know, try really hard to get people to their website. And it's like, that's not really that engaging because not everyone wants to take that extra step. So it's trying to find that middle ground of being both satisfying, but then not letting that be the end all be all. Yeah. Um, that that's really good. So you, um, and we talked, touched on it a little bit already, but you say that, you know, strong storytelling is it's pretty uncommon in the nonprofit and the, on the public sector marketing. Why, why is that so important and how can schools utilize strong storytelling? So this is, this is fascinating because I've, I've learned a lot about this in the last year or so, uh, because I, there's a study out there where this group of professors, they um, wanted to see how well nonprofits were utilizing storytelling. Okay. And storytelling in its true art form is character centered, that character then overcomes challenges over time and then, you know, achieves success or overcomes that adversity at the end, right? That's storytelling in its true form. And so this group of professors found 150 nonprofits and surveyed them about their communication strategy. And 97% of those nonprofits reported that storytelling was at the center of their communication strategy. So then those same professors then took those nonprofits, looked at every single communication piece that they put out in the last year, every social media post. And when they really looked at it um, and applied the true definition of storytelling, well less than half of them were actually utilizing storytelling in its true form, you know, because there are things like testimonials, informational summaries, you know, those aren't stories. And the reason why storytelling is important is because scientifically it has the best chances of engaging people at that deep level that we want to be able to keep, keep, you know, keep them engaged. And so yes, informational summaries and testimonials can be engaging, but they, they aren't nearly as engaging as when you can craft content into, into true, a true story in that way, where it's character centered overcome challenges, have success in the end. Um, and so if you can really, and it seems like it's a minor adjustment, um, but if you look at kind of the same content side by side, one as an informational summary and one as a story, it reads very, very different. Um, and so even just taking content and looking at it through that lens can really elevate content pretty quickly and, you know, entice engagement at a much different level. Yeah, I love that. That's a very interesting study. I'm sure if we um, interviewed and and asked all of our school folks if you know yeah. what's at the center, they would probably yeah. say storytelling, and and I bet it would be similar. It's like, well, you know, half of you maybe are are doing a good job at that, but but we we all have room for improvement. Yeah. Um, so this is the social media marketing. Um, you know, a, a, a podcast on social media for schools. So. Uh, with that being such an important tool and, and you talked about it being like the most important tool, it just seems to be, you know, so widely used. Um, why is social media so important and, and how do you feel it can be used to its fullest potential? Sure. So I think another important distinction to make for social media is to think about like for your own social media experience, right? If you're going to choose to have a brand be a part of your social media experience, you have to really like them. You have to really be connected. You have to really, because if you're choosing to have a brand be part of that experience, it's very personal to you, right? Um, and so schools though have such a unique opportunity because parents typically want to feel connected to their kids' school. Even community members want to feel connected to what the school is doing. So schools already have an advantage in um you know encouraging people to like share comment on their on their content because a lot of people want to see that kind of content in their feed you know versus a traditional brand who's trying to sell a product it's you know it's a much harder sell to get people to actively want to have that in their feed and so schools should really use that to their advantage and really be encouraging community members to you know be a part of this online community you know for our school and helping to give feedback and helping to give 
input and showing their love for students who are going on this trip, you know, so sometimes it's even as, as quote unquote simple. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, you know, for this audience, but you know, if you're telling a story about a student who got a um, all expenses paid trip to Washington, DC, you know, even just saying things like, let's show the students some love and, you know, comment a favorite place that they should go and see while they're there, you know, just things to really just pull people out and encourage them to engage in a meaningful way can really help to um, really help schools to use social media to its full advantage and um, kind of build that community around that online presence. Okay, now I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to be anxious to hear what you okay. said. I, what you'll say. I just was on a on a, a conference call today with a school that's going to a referendum. Okay. And um, they just said, uh, you know, I, we want to talk about it, Andrea. That you know, I'd I'd really just prefer to have the comments all turned off on social media. The likes and the shares are fine, but I just I really don't want the comments on there. Um, I have a strong opinion on that, but I want to hear from your standpoint. Is that helping a school um, with their marketing efforts and and why are we why not? Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Sure. So, so I'm really glad you brought that up because it is kind of a sticky thing. Um, and I'm not a lawyer, so you know I have to confirm this, but. Something that is very true, though, that public sector organizations have to be aware of is that when they're putting content out on social media, that's public information. And any community member could technically file an open records request for any information related to X, Y, and Z, and that would include social media content. Now, that's a really emerging um, it's a really emerging topic in the public sector, especially public sector marketing. Um, but there are laws around information that you put out on social media and your obligation as a public sector organization to maintain that. And you don't want to do anything that makes anyone feel like you're restricting free speech, right? And so mm -hmm. when you turn off comments, then, you know, is it illegal? I don't know. I mean, it would, it, you know, you'd have to really talk to a lawyer about that, but you're not doing yourself any services by even putting out the impression that you're trying to restrict free speech and that you're not allowing for an open forum on social media. Because if you're going to be on social media, then you have to be willing to commit to it and it's full in its full potential and allow it to be the open forum that it was designed to be. Um, and so now again, are there instances where it's easy, you know, not easier, but, um, and I hate to bring out this example, but like the situation that UWL is going through right now with their chancellor, I've noticed that they've started to turn off, you know, comments on any posts related to the transition. And it's like, yeah, you know, I could, I could kind of see that. Is it kind of a gray line? Yes. But when you weigh the pros and cons, it's, probably an okay choice. But unless there's something like that, where it's really high profile and really, you know, could get ugly pretty quickly, you're better off allowing for an open forum so that people don't feel restricted in what they can say and how they engage with the content, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, um, and they know that they can't comment. So that that's the, the view of, hey, trust and transparency and things like that. But the other thing is, is, and my big thing is social media, like, the channel itself is meant to be social yeah. and you're the only way to reach more people is to encourage more engagement. Like you said, you're asking those questions. Where's, where's a favorite place that you, they should visit while they're in Washington, DC. I mean, those are the types of questions. And then when you get comments, the algorithm says, Hey, this is important, uh, you know, uh, content, we're going to show it to more people. So really by limiting comments, you're really going to restrict your ability to use social media to its fullest potential yes. to reach, to reach your, your community and, and beyond with all the great things happening. And, you know, for every, um, negative comment, there's usually 30 positive comments. And so, I just I I just hate to think of the fact of turning it turning off the ability to get great engagement, great feedback, you know, improve your school for just that chance of that one person commenting yeah. something. I totally agree. And I think another thing that's important to call out too is that if you know you're going to be putting something out that could spur some controversy, then it's important to have a plan in place for how you're responding to those negative comments. How quickly can we take the conversation offline without deleting anything? So even just as simple as whenever there's a comment like that, you know, we thank you so much for your input, you know, um, please email this email or, you know, call this number and I'd be happy to talk to you about it further. Because it seems like, and I don't have any data to 
prove this, but as soon as the original organization responds to a comment like that, it's kind of like, oh shoot, I guess they are watching. I better be careful what I say, you know? So it kind of shuts it down pretty fast and it kind of really tests, you know, is this person saying this like they're serious enough where then they're going to reach out to continue this conversation or are they just saying it to say it and they don't have a lot of and that kind of gives you a gauge as to how serious the the comment really was and whether it is a deep deeper seated issue that they should be you know aware of yeah definitely so as we wrap up um what would you say is your best social media tip you know, I think we went through a lot of them, um, just the storytelling and the encouraging engagement whenever you can, directing people back to your website. Um, but something we haven't mentioned is really jumping on trends. And um, mm -hmm. I almost cringe saying that because um, I've always been one to take the road less traveled. I don't do things just because everyone else does it. But I've had to really force myself to think of it more as, especially in the context of social media, the reason why trends exist is because it's content that people want to see. And so it's not just jumping on trends, but thinking about it more as, you know, being up to date and putting out the content that people want to see, which is typically, um, you know, the trends. So staying up on trends um, and, and also just having fun. I mean, part of the good thing about social media is that you have the opportunity to show some personality and be lighthearted. And, um, you know, and I think that's the one tool that schools have in their tool belt where they can really be there you know, be playful and um, show some personality. So not being afraid to do that. Um, you know, your school, you're, you know, you're enticing learning and you're doing fun things and you're doing great things for the students, like have fun with it. You know, audiences love that and the students love it. Yeah, I love it. And an easy way to keep up with what's trending is to include your students in your yeah. storytelling as well. So, um, Great advice, Miranda. We could probably talk all day. I, um, I've i loved this conversation. If somebody's listening and they're like, gosh, you know, Miranda might really be able to help out our school in uh, moving forward with some marketing efforts and some initiatives. Um, you know, how do you work with schools? And, and maybe you want to share some of your uh, best way to stay connected to you. Sure. Um, so I would say, you know, we can probably include my email, you know, yep. somewhere, um, but that would be the best thing, just making a connection. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I don't, I'm working on building um, a website, so I, I can't, I know I'm preaching to the choir, of course, but <laughs> Um, just as I'm starting off, you know, sending an email and just starting the conversation, asking questions, because um, I think the best piece of advice, and this isn't meant to be a shameless plug, but, um, you know, we all are good in our own areas. And so really just being honest as an organization to say, okay, we need some help with marketing. You know, let's not try to do it all our, ourselves. Let's, you know, invest in having someone come in from a different perspective that can see things a little bit differently, that can bring everything together, because um, that relatively small investment is going to be able to set you for success for a long time. Um, so not being afraid to ask for that help and to invest in it, um, I think is a really, really important thing to consider. So, so yeah, yeah find me on LinkedIn or send me an email. Okay. And what is your email? Could you just read it out? Sure. Just, yep. It's Miranda, M-I-R-A-N-D-A dot Greenwald, G-R-E-E-N-W-O-L-D at gmail.com. Okay. Miranda Greenwald <laughs> at gmail.com. Um, what I love is, uh, you know, you, you, you would help kind of draft out, okay, what are the steps? Cause schools know they need to take steps, they, but they don't necessarily know what steps they need to take. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of times you have the ability to probably do some of these things that Miranda described today, but you don't even know what you have to do, you know? And so I think you can really help pull that together. And I'm sure you help take action on the implementation side as okay. well. But if they yep. want to do it all themselves, they can, right? Yep. Yep. So looking at all the communication pieces you already have, let's look at them, see if there's opportunities to make it better. Let's create some templates so that, you know, I, you have really beautiful pieces that you can then, you know, add on and change every, you know, every time um, to make sure it aligns with everything. So, and I guess the last thing I'll just reinforce, because this is especially important in public organizations, is that it's not just about growing your reach and growing enrollment and doing all of that, but this is also an opportunity for you to um, be really resourceful with the resources that you have. You know, if you only have so much time and money in a year to do marketing, let's make sure that the time and money that you're spending on it is actually making a difference. And you're not doing something just because, you know, you think that that's what, what you should be doing or that's what marketing is. So. Yeah, absolutely. Do you mention direct mail? Well, there's a cost to that. And sometimes that can be pretty substantial. So where do we want to put, put everything? Um, awesome uh, advice. 
Thank you so much for joining us today. You can check out more from Miranda by emailing her uh, LinkedIn. I know she'll have a website as well soon. Um, but thanks so much for hanging out with us today. Yeah, thank you. It was fun. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, we'll see you back next week with another great guest. And until then, keep telling those real stories, not those fake stories. Right, Miranda? Right. <laughs> yes, you got this. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.